Hello, Music Theory. This is David Farrell. Today's video, writing and talking about pitch. We are going to be talking about the pitch element in music. We're going to be talking about how we describe it in Western music and how we write it out. Let's get right into it. Pitch describes the highness or lowness of a sound. Okay? Pitch is one of those four core components of any sound, and pitch describes whether it's a very, very high sound or whether it's a very, very low sound. There are an almost infinite number of possible pitches. There's lots and lots and lots of pitches that exist out there. Some instruments are built to play a really wide range. Uh, fretless string instruments like violins or the human voice are really, really flexible in the number of pitches they sing. My voice can slide between pitches, and all our voices do. We can slide and gliss between all these different pitches. Some instruments are a lot more limited, like pianos or most wind instruments. They can only play very specific pitches. Bum, bum, bum. Very, very, very locked in. Western music is attuned to this mindset. Western music uses a very small and very specific set of the vast, vast possibility of pitches that are out there. To describe the pitches that we use, these really precise different sounds, we use letter names. Okay? We use letter names. We can start on A and we can go up that musical alphabet. The musical alphabet starts on A, goes up through B, C, D, E, F, and G. Once we get to G, we start back over at A again, and we just keep going up and up and up and up. If we go down, of course, once we get down to the bottom to A, if we were to keep going down, then we would find another G. And so we keep recycling and repeating these same note names over and over and over again. You can see on our keyboard how they're laid out on the white notes. All the white notes of a keyboard correspond with a different note letter name, and all of these letter names describe a different pitch, okay? Some of these pitches repeat a lot of times, and that's really normal for our Western music, but these are the seven musical letter names that we're going to be using to describe a pitch. The letter names cover all the white notes on our keyboard, but if we look at the black notes on the keyboard, we can see that there are some other notes that show up as well. To notate these pitches, we need what we call accidentals. Okay? An accidental is a symbol that alters the pitch of a note. It changes it. We have a couple of different accidentals that we use. A sharp, for example, which looks like a kind of like a pound sign, raises the pitch by one note. It takes our pitch and it says, play it one note higher on the keyboard. Oftentimes this means playing one of those black keys that are in between our white keys. And so if I, would, if I saw a C sharp, I wouldn't play the big white note with a C on it. I would move up one note to that little black key in the middle. That would be my C sharp. We also have the flat. The flat kind of looks like a letter B, and it tells us to play a lower pitch. It tells us to lower our pitch by one note. And again, this often results in us playing on a black key on our keyboard. And so, for example, maybe I would be playing a B natural, that white note you can see on our keyboard, but if I saw a flat modifying my pitch, I would play that black note right below the B natural. I would play a B flat. Once an accidental appears in music, it carries throughout an entire measure. And to cancel it out, we need our third most common accidental, which is a natural. That little natural symbol cancels out any previous accidentals and tells us to go back to the regular unaltered version of the pitch. Looking at this image of the keyboard, you can see that a lot of the black notes, all of the black notes, have two different names on them. Most pitches in music can be written in multiple ways. And when we have two pitches with different names that sound the same, we have a word for that. We call those pitches enharmonic. Enharmonic pitches sound the same. You play them on the same note on the keyboard, but they look different. For example, we can look at that black note between G and A. Well, one way to think of it as, is as one pitch higher than G natural. We might think of it as G sharp. And if, if we see a G sharp in our score, we would hit that key on the keyboard. 
we also might think of it as A flat, as one note below A natural. A flat and G sharp have the same key on the keyboard. They sound the same, but they look different when we write them. They are enharmonic pitches. Some of these white notes on our keyboard, you will notice, don't have a black key in the middle, and so they can feel a little bit odd. They're a little bit unique. If we think about, for example, the pitch E sharp, well, we would start on E and we would go up one note. We know that's what a sharp means, but there's no black note in the middle, and so we would go to the same note that we use to play F natural. E sharp and F natural sound the same. We play them on the same key, but they look different. They are also enharmonic pitches. I'm going to wrap up my talk on discussing pitch with some last accidentals. Less commonly seen accidentals include the double sharp, which kind of looks like an X here, and the double flat, which looks like two flats jammed next to each other. These do pretty much what you would expect them to do. They raise and lower a pitch by two notes on the keyboard. Again, these are a little bit less common, but it's useful to know what they do. If we see something like G double sharp, well, we would start on G at the keyboard. We would move up one note to the black note that has G sharp on it. And then we would move up a second note to the note that has A on it, A natural. G double sharp is enharmonic with A natural. There are different ways of writing the same pitch. Likewise, F double flat. We would start on the white key with F and we would go down two notes on our keyboard. Going down one note would take us to E and going down another note would take us to E flat. F double flat is enharmonic with E flat. We won't see these quite as often, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time, but they do show up every now and then, and so it's good to know what they mean. They just mean that we change the note twice instead of once. Now that we have an idea, as to how we'll be discussing pitch and how we talk about pitch in Western music, let's talk about how we're going to be writing pitch. We use a staff, which is a collection of five horizontal lines to help represent pitch in notation. When we're writing pitches on a staff, we're going to use the same notes we've been using to represent rhythm to also represent pitch. The note heads of our notes are going to be placed in a spot on the staff to help us figure out what pitch that they are. The note heads will always be placed either on a line, so that the line is going right through the middle of the note head, or inside of a space in our staff. Make sure it's clear, okay? I'm using a computer to notate this, and so it is very nice, but handwriting sometimes can be a little bit ambiguous. Make sure it's clear whether your note head is supposed to be on the line or in the space. And of course, the higher the line or space on the staff, the higher the pitch. The lower the line or the space, the lower the pitch. And so this line that I've notated would start with a low pitch and move up by step to a high pitch. You might be wondering what happens if we run out of space on our staff. Don't worry, if we need pitches higher or lower than the staff, we can continue drawing little extra lines called ledger lines to expand the space. With ledger lines, we just pretend that the staff keeps going. The thing to remember is that you have to continue alternating lines and spaces. And so if we look at the bottom of my staff here, we can see I have a note floating on a space below the lowest line. The next note then is going to be on the line one line below the staff. Following that, we have a note that would be in the space below that, and then our fourth note would be two lines below the staff. And we have the same thing happening above our staff. We start with the space that is on top of our staff. Our second high note is on a line, one line above the staff. Our third is in a space above that line, and our fourth high note is two lines above the staff. We can just keep going as long as we want, though the more ledger lines we get, the more complicated it is to read our note. So, even though we've limited the number of pitches to these letter names that we've got in Western music, there's still a lot of notes. 
You think about the lowest notes that you could hear, something like an electric bass or a tuba. You think about the highest notes you can hear, like a piccolo or a very high violin. That's a lot of notes, and our staff doesn't have that many spots to draw notes. This is why we need something at the front of our staff to help zoom in on a particular collection of notes, and that is called a clef. Okay? A clef at the beginning of our staff points us to a specific range of notes. Some clefs are used for higher pitches, some clefs are used for lower pitches, some clefs are used for kind of in the middle pitches, but a clef helps us figure out which kind of notes we're going to represent so that we don't try to squeeze too many ledger lines into one of our staffs. Let's look at some of the common clefs and figure out what they're going to be telling us about the pitches inside of them. Maybe the most common clef is what is called the treble clef. You can see the treble clef at the front of the staff on this page. The treble clef is also known as the G clef. Its image is based on the letter G. And I think if you kind of squint, you can see that it's kind of got a loopiness and a little bit of a hook there, like the letter G. Okay, And that little hook curves around the second line from the bottom of our staff. And that's where we're going to find the pitch G. Okay, The G clef, the little hook in the G, goes around, that's where we find that pitch G. So it kind of makes sense here. The treble clef is generally used for higher pitches. Violins, female voices, flutes, all read music in the treble clef staff. Once we know where G is, we can figure out where all the other notes in this, in this particular clef are going to be found. Let's look at them. We can count up our musical alphabet from that G and label the next pitch, which is A in the space, then B in the line, C in the space, D on the next line, E on the space, and F on the top line. And likewise, we can go down from G to F in the space below it and E in our bottom line. These are all the pitches inside of the treble clef staff, and we could use ledger lines to keep going if we wanted to. Let's talk about some common ways to remember where all these are, so you don't have to count from G every time you look at a staff. The lines of the treble clef, just the lines, are E, G, B, D, and F. One of the common mnemonics that we use to remember this is every good boy does fine. It's a very old-fashioned one. If you Google treble clef mnemonics on your computer right now, you will find lots of other ones, and maybe you'll find a more fun one to remember, and that's great too, as long as we can remember E, G, B, D, and F for our lines on the treble clef. For our spaces in the treble clef, from bottom to top, from lowest to highest pitch, we have F, A, C, and E. It spells the word face, and that is another common way that we remember this. Maybe you can find something easier, though. To be honest, I find it pretty hard to find something easier to remember than a word that is spelled out by the notes. Face spells out our spaces in the treble clef. Let's talk about the other most common clef that we encounter in music, the bass clef. The bass clef, like the treble clef, is one of the ones that we see a lot. The bass clef, like the treble clef, is based on a letter. It is also known as the F clef. It is based on the letter F. It is a little hard to see, I admit, uh, I, but this is what they tell me, maybe a very old-fashioned version of the F. It's got a nice little loop and then two dots around the fourth line from the bottom of our staff. Helpfully, the pitch F is located between those two dots. And so with our bass clef, our F clef, you can always find that note F. From there, you can find all the notes on the bass clef. The bass clef is used generally for lower pitches. The bass, in, the instrument, the bass, a very low string instrument, men's voices, tubas, all of these typically read the bass clef. Let's look at some bass clef notes. Just like with our treble clef, we can musically alphabet our way from that F. Going up to the next space above that F between the two dots, we have a G, and our top line is an A. If we go down from that F between the two dots, we have an E, and then a D, a C, and then a B, an A, and then a G on the bottom of our staff. Again, we can just count through our musical alphabet when we need to identify a note from F, 
but like the treble clef, we'll try and figure out some easier ways to remember. The lines in our bass clef are, from lowest to highest, G, B, D, F, and A. Good boys do fine always is a common mnemonic that we use. It's similar to the E, G, B, D, F, every good boy does fine. But again, if you Google bass clef mnemonics, you'll find some other ones if you'd like to find something better. G, B, D, F, and A. Good boys do fine always. That helps us find the lines in our bass clef. The spaces in our bass clef spell out A, C, E, and G. The phrase all cows eat grass is one that I have heard before. It's a relatively common mnemonic. As you can tell by now, you can try to find other ones, but this is another useful one to remember our bass clef spaces, A, C, E, and G. The grand staff is a pair of two staves, one treble clef and one bass clef staff. It's used for instruments with wide ranges that can play lots of notes, like the piano or the harp. It can play very low sounds and very high in that sounds all at once. The grand staff is useful for us right now because it shows us the, the connection between our treble clef and our bass clef staff. I've drawn two notes, on my, one on my treble clef and one on my bass clef, and they're both the pitch C. They are also both the same C. They are what we call middle C, which is the C in the center of the piano. That is the same C in each staff, and so this C below our treble clef staff is the exact same note as the C at the very top of our bass clef staff. This shows how the two are connected. The treble clef sits, the treble clef's very low notes are the same as the bass clef's very high notes, and this is why they're useful for different instruments. Let's wrap up with one last clef, and then we'll be done for the day. The C clef is a less common clef, but we do see it from time to time in a couple of different scenarios. It, one of the special things about our C clef is that it can move around the staff. The treble clef and bass clef tend to always be found in the same place, but this C clef can sort of be shifted to different spots in our staff. Wherever we find it, that little notch in the center of the clef marks that same note we just talked about, middle C. This placement of a C clef is called alto clef. Alto clef places middle C on the central note of our staff used by the violas, a member of our string family, kind of a big violin, one way to think about it. It's not one that's terribly common, but if you're going to be going forward with a lot of music reading, it's good to be familiar with C clefs and alto clefs because we're going to have to read them from time to time. The best thing to remember is that that notch in the center always represents middle C, and from there you can count out and find other notes in your pitches. Congratulations, you've made it to the end. We talked a lot about pitch today and we got a lot of information out. We talked about how we define pitch and the specific way we talk about it in Western music, which is with our musical alphabet from A to G. We talked about accidentals and how they can make pitches higher or lower to give us all the different notes that we'll be seeing in Western music. And then we talked about writing pitch on the staff using a treble clef, using a bass clef and we introduced a little bit of C clef as well. All of these things are things we're gonna be using a lot going down the line. Feel free to rewind this video, watch it again. If you have questions, bring them to class. Otherwise, thanks for watching it, and please have a great day. I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.